It's estimated that Egypt lost 80% of its military capacity, and along with Syria and Jordan, suffered over 30,000 dead and injured. People didn't really know what was going to happen next. I mean, people were scared. The whole country was at a total loss of what to do. The fighting may have been over, but it hadn't created the conditions where the two sides could come together. Peace was as far away as ever. For the Arabs, the Six-Day War was an utter disaster. Before this whirlwind campaign, Israel had been a tiny wedge of land, squeezed between Arab states, only nine miles wide at its narrowest. Suddenly, it was a Middle East superpower, and five times the size. The borders had been pushed back to swallow a piece of Syria up here, called the Golan Heights. To the east, Israel had seized the West Bank, and in the south, it now occupied Egypt's entire Sinai Peninsula, a huge expanse of desert. From this newfound position of strength, Israel's leaders demanded that the Arab world recognize the state of Israel. Arab leaders met in Sudan to formulate their response. They were emphatic. They would not recognize Israel and insisted on a total Israeli withdrawal from the territories it had just occupied. Over the next few years, both sides became entrenched and nowhere was this more visible than along the new border with Egypt. The Suez Canal. The canal is one of the world's busiest shipping lanes, allowing ships to pass between Europe and Asia without sailing round Africa. But after the Six-Day War, this international waterway was closed to shipping as sporadic fighting between both sides continued to flare up. The Israelis and the Egyptians now faced each other eyeball to eyeball across the canal. The Egyptians could never accept that this was a permanent frontier. But the Israelis were equally determined. Egyptians now watched in horror as the Israeli military machine went to work. All along the Suez Canal, the Israelis built a massive network of walls, forts and trenches that became known as the Bar Lev Line. Israel resolved that Egypt would never force its way back into the Sinai. But they weren't just relying on the Bar Lev line for defense. The Israelis also had a system for rushing troops to the front line. Israel has a small population and can't afford a large standing army. So every male Israeli does three years national service and remains a reservist into his 40s or 50s, ready to be mobilized in times of war. Today, females also do national service and they can also be called up if war breaks out. 30 years ago, an army of 250,000 men could be mobilized within 72 hours if the Arabs showed signs of attacking. But after the Six Day War, that didn't seem very likely. The Israelis had practically destroyed Arab air power. Israeli intelligence was now sure the Arabs wouldn't try anything until they'd rebuilt their air forces. And that would take another 10 years. The Israelis were now supremely confident that if their neighbors so much as twitched, they would batter them into submission once more. But in Cairo, something had happened that the Israelis hadn't reckoned with. A new Egyptian president with a new sense of purpose, Anwar Sadat. 
when Sadat came to power in 1970, Egypt was still a demoralized country, smarting from the loss of the Sinai. Sadat was considered a moderate by many, but one of the first things he did was appoint a dynamic and popular new military commander, General Saad El Shazli. Shazli was given the job of revitalizing Egypt's poorly trained and under-equipped army. Because Sadat was determined to do what the Israelis least expected, fight back. Sadat had decided that the only way to win back the Sinai from the Israelis was to make war on them. His plan was to launch a spectacular crossing of the canal and retake a strip of land in the Sinai. Sadat hoped that this would force the Israelis to negotiate a withdrawal from the rest of Sinai. But for this plan to work, Sadat was going to need help. Sadat found a willing ally in the Soviet Union, as the Israelis had with the USA. In the 1970s, both the United States and the Soviet Union were adamant that neither superpower would dominate the oil-rich Middle East. The Soviets provided Egypt with the latest surface-to-air missiles, called SAMs. These missiles, supported by thousands of conventional anti-aircraft guns, could effectively paralyze the Israeli Air Force. The Egyptian commander, General Shazli, would not have to rely on his weakened air force to deal with Israeli warplanes. Nor would Sadat attack alone. Another of his allies, President Assad of Syria, would be joining in the fight. The key to the Egyptian plan was a surprise coordinated ground attack on Israel. The Syrians would attack on the Golan at exactly the same moment as the Egyptians struck along the entire length of the canal. But Shazli knew that no matter how stunned the Israelis might be by this two-pronged offensive, they would soon counterattack with their most lethal weapon, their air force. And that was where the SAM missiles came in. Shazli concentrated his SAMs along the Suez Canal. These missiles could bring down any Israeli planes that came within 15 miles. The SAMs and regular artillery guns would create a protective umbrella, shown here in red, under which Egyptian boats and infantry could cross safely. They would then seize the forts of the Barlev line and secure a strip of land a few miles deep into the Sinai. The date of the attack was set for October the 6th, when the tides would give the most favorable conditions for crossing the canal. But October the 6th was also the holiest day of the Jewish year, Yom Kippur, when Israelis would be at home or the synagogue. With their plans in place, the Egyptians and their Syrian allies set about ensuring that the Israelis had no idea they were about to be attacked on two fronts. The Egyptians put into effect a complicated deception plan to try and lull Israeli military intelligence into complacency. They had been gradually mobilizing their reserves, but at the beginning of October, they demobilized 20,000 men and sent them home. From what the Israelis could see, it didn't look like the Egyptian army was gearing up for war. As for the Egyptian soldiers based beside the canal, they were told to act as if nothing much was up. They could go swimming and bask in the sun in full view of the Israeli troops in the forts of the Bar Lev line. Any military activity the Israeli lookouts did spot appeared to be just another regular exercise. By day, they watched as Egyptian troops came close to the canal to carry out maneuvers. 